Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this event organized by the Renewable Heating and Cooling Platform and the EHPA jointly. My name is Elisabetta. I am EU Project Officer at the European Heat Pump Association, and I have the privilege of moderating today's event. While our session may stretch for almost two hours without interruption, I assure you that uh, your engagement will remain high thanks to our exceptional lineup of speakers. To kick things off, let me provide a concise overview of our agenda. I will start by addressing logistical aspects and introducing the European Technology and Innovation Platform. Following this, I will hand the floor over to our speakers. And after the presentation, we will delve into a panel discussion featuring Q&A session and conclude with some final remarks. Please bear in mind that the panel discussion is your pivotal moment, providing with the opportunity to engage directly with our esteemed speakers by posing questions and expressing your interest. Please ensure you qualify the intended recipient of your question before asking it on the chat or in the Q&A section. Seize this moment to actively participate and make the most of this enriching exchange. And also, all along the presentation, you will see QR code and don't hesitate absolutely to scan them with your mobile phone. Regarding logistical aspect, I'd like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and it will be promptly available on EHPA YouTube channel and the slide will be available as well to all participants. Again, you can ask your question via the chat or via the Q&A section. Thank you for your attention and let's embark on this informative journey together. So today's webinar is focused on market trends and development of the renewable heating and cooling sector. It forms an integral part of a series of matchmaking events and panel discussions designed to delineate prospective challenges. Indeed, the enduring nature of market trends extending across years and even decades plays a pivotal role in fostering the growth and advancement of the renewable heating and cooling sector. This alignment with significant societal and technological shift allows for a deliberate approach to responsiveness and adaptation, transcending reactive measures and fostering the formulation of a comprehensive strategic framework. This event features participants from a variety and use sectorial organizations spanning a broad spectrum that included those operating in the realm of building, transportation and industrial sector. With that in mind, let's swiftly recap the essence of the RHC platform and its overarching goal. First of all, I would like to present you the partners of our project, which come from different sectors, um, for example, district heating and cooling, solar thermal, geothermal, heat pump and other renewable energies. So what exactly is the RHC platform? To begin, uh, again, take a moment to scan the QR code using your mobile phone, which will, be, which will redirect you to the RHC platform website. Established as the European Technology and Innovation Platform since 2016, its primary objective is to bring together stakeholders from diverse sectors, including, as I already mentioned, biomass, district heating and cooling, geothermal, solar thermal, and heat pumps. The collective aim is to formulate a unified strategy to enhance the utilization of renewable energy technologies for heating and cooling across Europe. This strategic approach involved not only spotlighting the safety, cleanliness, efficiency and cost competitiveness of renewable energy technologies, but also demonstrating how they increasingly contribute to society. This, in turn, enhances the overall contribution of renewable heating and cooling to the European Union. The platform's multifaceted approach encompasses the integration of improved and emerging technologies, 
fostering innovation and development, as well as actively engaging in policy formulation, securing funding and implementing pilot project. Together, all these elements form a cohesive framework driving the renewable heating and cooling platform towards its overarching objective. Let's delve quickly now into the refined details of our goal. First of all, foster collaborative working relationships with other national and regional platforms, establish and update strategic research and innovation agendas per technology areas from basic research to market uptake, identify priority in the short, medium and long term, recognize cross-cutting priorities such as education and training, socio-economic aspects, international cooperation, but also identify innovation barriers, notably those associated with regulation and financing, and provide updates on the execution of research and innovation activities across the European, national and industrial level. On a related note, an intriguing resource at your disposal is the Renewable Heating and Cooling Project Database managed by us, EHPA. This freely accessible database is hosted on the RHC website and in the subsequent slide, you, you will catch a glimpse of its user-friendly interface and functionality. You can explore the wealth of information it offers for a deeper understanding of ongoing projects in the renewable heating and cooling sector. This is um, how the database looks like. You can see that uh, if you're searching a project uh, specifically, you can search it also by filter it by area application or technology readiness level. And uh, um, you can see that you will uh, you will see other um, other project uh, in this uh, in this database. So um, thank you for uh, for hearing me and thank you for participating to this webinar. Um, it is time now to uh, quickly present the first speaker. Uh, welcome today, welcome to this panel, Christoph. Uh, Christoph Brunner is a CEO at AEE Intech in Austria. The main topics of his work are energy and research efficiency, the integration of renewable energy for the industry like solar process heat and membrane distillation for wastewater purification and process water upgrading. He is project coordinator of several national and international projects and operating agent in the International Energy Agency as well of solar heating and cooling. He is also a member of the board of the European Technology Platform for Renewable Heating and Cooling that I just present and member of the Board of Partnership of the European Network of Decarbonization of the Industry. He is also a UNIDO expert in energy efficiency and lecturer at Applied Science Universities. Today, Christoph will tell us more about future innovations for a sustainable thermal energy supplies for the European manufacturing industry. Thank you for being here, Christoph, and the floor is yours. Yeah. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, um, Elisabetta, for this kind introduction. Um, yeah, um, maybe we, if we can start with my first slide, yeah, um, the topic um, I want to present today, it's about, uh, let's say, the future innovations for sustainable thermal energy supply for European manufacturing industry. So how can we decarbonize uh, the European uh, industry? Next slide, please. Um, to dive into this topic, I thought I'd give you a first kind of overview on, on the energy demand, uh, because it's maybe not so um, well known uh, how industry, how much energy industry needed and uh, yeah, and, and which kind of energy the industry needed. Um, first of all, one third of the total energy demand in Europe is allocated uh, to the industry, that's approximately one third. And of this one third, so what, what is allocated to the industry, also again, one third uh, is electricity. Um, and two thirds um, of, of the energy demand of the industry, it's heat. This is also maybe not that well known because when generally speaking about uh, energy demand, always uh, Electricity is on the on, on the top of the discussion. Um, 
And if you see this 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 uh, um, uh, graph on on the left side, you can uh, see that um, renewable energy so parts of this uh, of this two thirds of energy demand of of, of heat is only ten percent. So it's really a big challenge also for the future um, to uh, increase, let's say, um, these numbers and also to to reach um, the targets what what are in the Green Deal and 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 other um, policy papers are um, defined. Um, Another important point, uh, especially for renewable uh, uh, as a heating technologies, are temperature levels. Uh, you will hear it then later also in my, my presentations further on, um, because very uh, there's a very close link between the efficiency of um, most of the renewable energy technology and the temperatures that provides the energy. And um, so we also had to look here in in TIP which kind of uh, temperatures are needed, um, and if you have a look on the on on this heat demand of the industry, you can find that uh, about 30 percent uh, at this low temperature sector. So it's about 100 as a below 100 150 degrees. Then uh, 22 percent are in this medium temperature uh, sector. Uh, up to uh, 350, 400 degrees, and uh, nearly 50% it's at the high temperature sector. So everything like for the steel industry, etc. Um, these are this this energy demand. Yeah, but in general, um, um, the share of fossil energy is still too high huh? um, uh, to uh, to reach the targets. And then the next slide, please. Um, there's now um, the possibilities to. Um, yeah, to change something, to 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 reach these goals of decarbonization. And I tried to visualize this within this 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 picture. So we have on the one hand um, the energy supply. I don't know. Do you see my my cursor? Can you see this? Uh, no. Okay. Then. Um, yeah, so you, you, we have we have the energy supply system um, with electricity energy, of course, uh, renewable and en electricity integration uh, with wind uh, power, uh, PV, etc. Then we have thermal energy um, as, uh, with different technologies or the possibilities. Uh, hydrogen is let's say on the on the top of the discussion, of course. Bio mass, um, bio waste, um, electrification of, of of the furniture heat pumps, solar thermal, district heating, um, geothermal, um, these are, let's say, thermal energy technologies which can provide energy mainly for the industry. Then we have one big part also um, to decarbonize the industry, uh, and this is in, in, the, in the industry itself, um, so changing the process, changing uh, technology in the process, electrification of the processes, energy efficient processes and also this uh, password process intensification. I will come up uh, to this uh, later on in my further slides. Um, and then um, the whole picture of circular economy uh, means, okay, how can we recycle uh, the, um, um, the output out of the industry, but also um, can we link the outcome like energy out output, like uh, waste heat, like electricity, like hydrogen, maybe biofuels, which came out uh, uh, out of uh, different production sites. Uh, can this also be, let's say, reused in other industry sectors, in other industry parks, for example? But also uh, carbon capture and utilization, of course, um, um, this is a big issue. And then um, also the material reuse and the upgrade. Next slide, please. Starting with the with the efficiency. So um, um, efficiency is the first fuel. This is, I think, uh, true. Um, we we really have to reduce the the energy demand in the industry. Otherwise, it's not possible to uh, reach these targets. What what we want to reach because um, the renewable energy sources they are not eternal so we really have to uh, uh, care on that and and really be careful how to use and uh, how and in which air parts we use the renewable energy sources so first of all uh, to reduce the consumption this is important produce 
long-lasting products. Um, this, this, uh, these are uh, possibilities. Um, yeah, uh, also to be more efficient in general um, for the for in the whole production manufacturing line. Um, then coming to process intensification, um, the, um, this passport I mentioned already before. What does this mean? This means that we have to change the the process technology, the kind how we produce uh, uh, in different processes uh, our products um, dramatically for certain uh, um, uh, industry sectors and for certain areas. So it means to enhance process efficiency by reducing process steps to simplify uh, the equipment and the design and to minimize these energy loss losses, um, but also um, to uh, create new reactor designs. Um, this uh, uh, um, idea to change from batch processes uh, to continuous processes with a continuous energy um, um, supply, which also increases the efficiency, uh, and then also this advanced process control. So these are different um, methodologies and, 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 and uh, ideas how to optimize the, the processes and so to reduce the, the energy demand. And another possibility is um, to optimize the system. So think about how can we uh, recover waste heat within uh, a company by optimizing uh, the heat exchanger um, um, network, for example. And here we have different methodologies, different possibilities. One of them is this pinch point methodology, uh, which optimize um, these heat exchanger uh, uh, networks within a company, but also within, for example, um, um, a business park. Next, next slide, please. Um, I took out here um, just that you get an idea um, um, uh, about technologies, um, the, the different schemes, how they um, divided these different technologies in unit operations and also to identify that here then uh, new uh, technologies, which has, let's say, a, a higher um, or the, which, which are optimized in, then, in this sense that their, um, the heat transfer is much better, the output of, of, of the products is it's much higher, um, and, and also that the continuous energy demand uh, is, is given by continuous processes. Just a two, two uh, examples, it's on, the, on the, the first picture on the right side, it's a spinning disk. Um, this is a technology to uh, optimize the mixing behavior within uh, fluids, two fluids, or a fluid and a gas, for example. Um, and uh, the other picture is uh, below, it's an oscillating uh, reactor. Um, with this oscillating reactor, also the rheology uh, of uh, fluids, but also the, the energy input and the, and the conversion of uh, chemical reactions can be optimized can be increased by uh, a, a factor of 10, for example. Um, of course, this is partly still in research areas, but let's say these are the future for optimizing technologies in general. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and uh, if we have now optimized uh, uh, industrial process, um, then it, it's not like uh, in the past or it's uh, it is at the moment quite often that we have one energy source like uh, natural gas. In the future, um, there will be a mix of different renewable energy sources. Uh, why will, will it be like this? Because uh, as I said before, uh, renewable energy is not an internal uh, uh, source. Um, for example, biomass, we can cannot use this biomass uh, like we want because it's limited. Uh, and this is also true for other renewable energies, for hydrogen, for example. And um, how we use renewable energies, this has to be yeah, on, a, on, on a very, um, let's say, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind that, that we really be very careful um, how much we use it and that it also used for the right uh, applications. What does it mean, right applications? Um, yeah. Here again, these temperature levels uh, came into in, in, into discussion because 
different energy, um, renewable energy sources has also the advantages at different energy, uh, different temperature level. Um, the graph, what you see here on, on this slide, uh, gives an overview roughly um, uh, on the one hand, um, which um, and renewable energy sources can be applied best uh, at which temperature levels and for which applications. There are different other uh, uh, factors which influence, of course, the possibility to, to use renewable energy um, um, uh, technologies. I just want to mention, for example, solar thermal um, depends, of course, um, uh, where this where the production site is located. It's, it's within a, a city, for example, then you have, of course, reduced uh, spaces for the collectors, etc. So there are, there are different, different uh, um, things what you have to consider if you uh, apply uh, renewable energies in a, in a combination, in a mix uh, with, with other renewable energy technologies. Next slide, please. Very general speaking, um, um, there is this uh, exegetic uh, approach what has, has to be followed. What does it mean, exegetic? Uh, it means um, this, the, the factor of temperature has to be, um, um, uh, as I, has to be uh, influence the, the, the application of the renewables. So everything above 200 has, um, um, we have uh, renewable energy technologies like hydrogen, like green gases, like biomass, like electricity, which should be mainly um, uh, approached here, uh, used here. And below 200, um, we have district heating, we have heat pumps, solar thermal at, at, at the um, uh, status quo of, of the technology development, uh, excess heat um, um, from other industry sectors, Ge geothermal or also um, the heat from biomass uh, combined heat and power technologies. Next slide, please. Um, and to also these this different renewable energy technologies, uh, they interact, of course, and, um, and here there's a big potential to optimize this interaction. And here digitalization uh, plays a big role. Um, on the one hand, um, for um, for planning um, uh, this combination of different uh, renewable energy technologies, but also then uh, during the operation that um, this um, interaction between let's say a solar thermal technology, a heat pump technology, maybe biogas uh, plant, um, this interaction of the energy supply, um, this um, uh, is, a, is, is as a, to optimize this digitalization with, will play a big role in that. Um, here's an example of a so-called digital energy twin. Um, so there's a, a simulation or a, a twin uh, created, uh, which is a virtual, uh, in a virtual environment and displays all possible combinations of these renewable energy technologies uh, and gives the best um, um, possibility out. And this gives uh, this goes then in the real into the real uh, uh, manufacturing industry and uh, and can then influence um, the the real situation. Um, this is on the one hand during the operation part, but also um, such a digital uh, twin or the energy twin can also be a very good basis for the future investment decisions. What does it mean that um, that you really can decide, okay, which kind of renewable energy technology fits best uh, for my industry production site? Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned also one renewable energy part is this excess heat or the waste heat potential. Um, I, I thought I, I give you here one example uh, from the pro province um, we are situated as Aintec, it's uh, Styria in Austria, uh, because we um, collected all this uh, excess heat potential from different industry sites uh, in our province and had a look how much is, is used already from, from this potential and uh, how much is this in share of the whole energy uh, demand. Um, and as you can see here, um, there's only 9% of this um, potential of excess heat uh, used. Uh, 91 is not used uh, in, 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 in our case. Um, the excess heat is at different temperature levels. Most of them, of course, it's at low temperature, below 50 degrees, but in combination with heat pumps, for example, uh, and also with these other ones, 
all of these um, 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 temperature levels can be used of the waste heat. And uh, the, um, it's about 30% of the uh, stirring uh, heating demand. Um, this could be covered by the excess heat. So it's really a, a huge potential worth to have a look at. And I think um, uh, these numbers are maybe not so different also to other regions in Europe. Next slide, please. Coming to solar thermal, uh, solar process heat uh, uh, is a big uh, potential um, um, and especially uh, a technology which provides renewable energy really without CO2 emissions. Um, there are different um, technologies which can be applied for different uh, industry sectors and also for different temperatures. Uh, you can see um, below here uh, different collector types, um, uh, which can provide temperatures up to 400 degrees. So non-concentrating collectors uh, up to 150 degrees, and then uh, all these uh, technologies with concentrating collectors. And next slides, please. Um, and there are worldwide um, uh, a lot of um, best practice examples already uh, for different uh, applications in different industry sectors. There's um, one, one database where you can collect all this information. Here, just a few pictures uh, out of also from, from Europe, but also from China, from uh, South America, from Asia, etc., um, which were solar thermal um, technologies providing heat um, at different uh, temperature levels for industrial applications. For example, textile industry, um, uh, food and beverage industry, mining industry. So these are the main areas. Next slide, please. Um, another future area for solar thermal is uh, generate uh, hydrogen out of uh, the sun directly. Um, at the moment, um, um, there's very often this combination, uh, let's say the, the approaches in, in that form that uh, photovoltaic is producing electricity and then we have a, a electrolyzer which is producing uh, um, um, hydrogen out of water. It's it's one way because uh, these are the technologies which are at the moment on the, at the market. But uh, for the future, um, uh, it's maybe not the most efficient uh, uh, way. And for the future, um, there are different approaches also to to use directly the sunlight, directly the photons from from the sun, and um, to convert. Um, water, wastewater, because here we have an added value to, to purify this wastewater, for example, and to convert this by catalysts, uh, then also to hydrogen, or but also to other other um, uh, uh, green fuels like like uh, methanol, uh, etc., or methane. But of course, these technologies. Uh, early stage, uh, uh, and there's a lot of research still needed, but uh, a big future uh, uh, potential uh, for these technology technologies I can see. Next slide, please. Um, we have also um, this, this interaction um, uh, from different technologies, and I want to show you here what does this mean in this interaction to, uh, to increase uh, this uh, uh, share of uh, uh, green gases, for example. This is an example to uh, generate uh, 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 hydrogen over an electrolyzer in combination with wind and PV, um, as I mentioned it before. But using this 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 hydrogen either directly in a in a in a um, gas distribution network and bring it then to the industry, or uh, in, in in this case in this in this example of this project to combine it with a biogas plant um, to to uh, make this technology of methanization, which which means um, um, yeah to to uh, the part of the, the CO2 part in the biogas will be converted into methane uh, um, why this uh, methanization process and then to uh, 
double more or less the output of the green gas uh, out of a biogas plant. And next slide um, shows this this approach of of hubs of circularities. Uh, what does it mean? So we, um, it it should should show you that uh, industry is not a single um yeah production site some uh, uh, somewhere and uh, we have to consider just the energy supply for this single production site but the the key will be to integrate this industry within the region within uh yeah um different possibilities um of the um, uh, uh this with with uh district heating networks with gas networks etc and so um to 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 create a win-win situation for um, the industry, but also the people who are living in this region. Coming to my last slide um, summary, what I want to give you uh, out of this presentation, on the one hand, to reduce the energy demand. This is a, 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 a very important factor of, uh, of uh, the decarbonization um, pathway. Um, Efficiency is the first fuel, just remind, remember this, um, and uh, also to optimize the processes itself. Then, of course, uh, innovative energy technology supply processes uh, are important, also to increase the efficiency in these technologies, uh, research, etc., is still needed, but there's also a lot of uh, um, technologies already on the market here. Um, then the consequent energy supply under an energetic consideration, so temperature level, um, I mentioned these two temperature levels, um, but also to, to integrate this in the energy um, uh, supply um, possibilities, and uh, also to optimize then this energy supply by digitalization. Then we have this first in a row, the first of kinds demonstrators, which are so important that we have following up um, uh, industry out of out of um, this um, process. Uh, yeah, emerging energy carriers, green energy carriers like hydrogen ammonia, they will have for sure a role, but we have to be careful that it's, uh, let's say, not the only solution for, for the energy supply for the industry. And um, to um, yeah, bring in industries in uh, the region in, in and, and also circularities, uh, circular economy. Um, this will be one of the crucial um, things um, to reach the decarbonization of the industry. Next slide. I think there's one. Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight we have a, a, a conference in April uh, this year uh, for those who want to uh, um, yeah, uh, come to our conference, Isaac, uh, in Graz, in, in Austria. There are still possibilities. At the moment, we have about 350 to 400 participants already registered. And especially uh, uh, decarbonization will be one of the, the, the uh, main topics within this ISIC conference in different areas. Um, and also this approach of hubs of circularities, what I mentioned uh, last, um, this will be discussed within the workshop. So I'm, I will be happy uh, to, uh, to welcome you at the conference. Thank you very much. And yeah, looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, it, was, uh, it was very interesting, actually. Um, and I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of questions during the panel discussion. Um, it is now time to uh, switch to the second speaker. Uh, welcome, Neil, Neil Turley. He is Managing and Engineering Director at Net Green EU and Net Green Solar LTD. He has two decades involvement in the application of heat pump technology from an R&D program to commercialize a thermal energy solar thermal, sorry, hybrid heat pump solution for Southern Europe to engineering design consultative contract on commercial sized project. Neil today will tell us more about positive market trends, urban and rural, but still with some potential challenges to allow full acceptance. Thank you for being here today, Neil, um, and the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, yeah, so the presentation I give today is really just about the market um, that I've been involved with in terms of the consultant as well as actually um, designing and actually installing 
heat pumps in the residential sector. So in the first look on the slide, I'm trying to demonstrate what um, new areas that heat pumps are going into and what are the supports mechanisms available in Europe today. Um, so when you see the first part, I uh, hope your screen's big enough to see all these little slides. Um, you can see that the grants look quite um, large compared to the price of installing a central heating boiler, for example. So your first impression will be quite generous. Um, there should be a lot of people involved in applying for these, these uh, grants. Um, we'll see later on in the presentation about this. So the second thing is um, heat networks. Um, I am actually involved in building a data center, uh, designing it um, in 2022. And this is the, the project um, it's, it's uh, involved with. It's based uh, in the area of Ealing in West London. Um, it's called the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation. Um, what they're proposing to do is re revitalize West Park London um, and take waste heat from data centers in this area of London. And then with water, water heat pumps, upgrade the water temperatures so that they can be used in domestic um, usages in, in residential housing. Um, this, this example I'm looking at here um, is, is based on, I think, three uh, data centers. Um, the one I was involved with was a 48 megawatt data center, so quite a large um, amount of energy to be used, but with the temperatures of 20 to 35 degrees delta T, um, there is a potential of upgrading that to 60 degrees minimum um, through the district heating system. So this, this example is being used in different areas of Europe, uh, not only in London, um, and I think it's a growth area that can be used um, to reduce the input from consumers. So that you just put it into the house and you provide domestic hot water and space heating. The rural sector, um, which I've been looking at in Portugal, um, should again, is, is some amazing advantages because the, the main um, fossil fuel being used for space heating and domestic hot water is bottled propane gas. So this price I've given there, 25, 27 cents kilowatt hour, is based on the propane um, 45 kilo bottle. So um, if you look at the idea where we can get a minimum of three COP um, from our heat pump, so therefore one kilowatt electrical energy provides you three kilowatts of heat. Um, there should be a no brainer in my mind in terms of um, it's, it's about three times cheaper than gas. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the first slide gave the ideas that, no, there's a lot of potential to the heat market, um, heat pump market, but um, there has been some studies made, statistical studies made throughout Europe. And the last one I saw was um, issued on Monday from the National Audit Office. Um, okay, so typical task for a national government is to obviously increase the number of heat pumps because it is the, the most viable proposition in terms of reducing our carbon emission. Um, so quite a big target. 28 million homes. Um, obviously, we've got a timeline, which is obviously 2030, um, and we're in 2024. So, as you can see, they've got a heavy uh, annual, the annual uh, installation has to be around about 600,000 per, per year. Um, and obviously, increasing on that as the market actually accepts heat pumps more and consumers understand them better. But um, the last indicator, as I put in red here, um, between May 2022 and December 2023 is just literally 
bit less than 10, so 10 of the target. Um, so not a good grasp of the market. Um, the typical conclusions, again, that we, we see in different studies um, are similar. So obviously price and the so-called um, complicated installation process um, is one of, the, one of the problems that the consumer is not really grasping. Um, low awareness, obviously we'll talk about that later on in the discussion. And then there's a, a, a confusion. Um, hydrogen has been brought up politically over Europe um, over the last few years as one of the solutions, which, which it has potential. Um, but I don't think, well, personally, I don't think that um, hydrogen is yet on the horizon to be used for quite a while yet, even though there's a lot of, lot of um, resources going in to try and get an infrastructure built. So, there was a lot of, I think there is a lot of confusion, plus there's a lot of greenwashing going on, um, which mixes up the whole um, argument in terms of the consumer uh, looking for different options in replacing their boiler. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so in the study, um, it's been mentioned a few times, but the, the, the elephant in the room, in my mind is our building stock throughout Europe. As you can see, well, it's quite a small slide, but if you blow it up, you can see um, the brown area on the graph on the right-hand side graph, the, the tabulation graph, uh, indicates um, the old um, buildings that we, that probably is not on par in terms of fabric, U values, uh, not very energy efficient. Um, whilst the green, the green bar sections are the new, relatively new um, builds. Now, if you go into a new build apartment nowadays, um, I had the example myself where literally sometimes the U values are so good that you don't actually have to turn the heating on sometimes during the winter. Um, and this was in the UK, the example I'm talking about. So the main issue with the brown bars is that these buildings, um, are, in terms of infiltration, um, have a lot of issues in terms of window fitments and door fitments. Um, and obviously the fabric has a certain amount of leakage. So, it's not just U values, it's also the actual envelope of the actual building. So um, when we're looking at central heating systems with boilers, we're using 70 to 80 degree temperatures of hot water. Um, this isn't really an issue because you have a, quite a lot of thermal um, high energy um, coming out of the radiators that provides us a certain amount of thermal uh, hot drafts of air passing over the rooms. So when we're talking about heat pumps, we're looking about a lower temperature of water. So commercially as well as residentially, we are trying to look down to use water temperature of 45 degrees, 50 degrees, um, which is advantageous because we can bring in renewable energies. But the issue is that um, those temperatures do um, provide, well, they, they make the occupant uncomfortable when you do have thermal drafts coming through uh, leakages in your fabric of your building. So recently, actually this week, I just lost, um, I went for a tender for um, installing our system, which is a hybrid heat pump system. Um, in a residential home in the UK. And the local authority came back with that they had already been using heat pumps um, with um, an air system and the occupants, the, the old uh, residents um, have had problems with comfort. So there are some issues here, I think we need to look at. Um, which I'll delve in further into the presentation. 
So the next uh, slide, please. So obviously with the previous graphs, um, we've got a large proportion of our housing stock being um, at least 40 plus more years old. So when we actually look at installing a heat pump, it isn't like a boiler where you literally put it on the wall and put a couple of radiators and a pump and some pipe work. Um, it is a bit more involved. And so this it kind of questions again, this the initial uh, first slide I had with the grants valuations. Um, they may look generous initially, but when you start looking at the actual retrofit requirements of the building, residential building, um, maybe there are some questions in terms of the actual size of these grants or subsidies. So obviously the first item is the utility and the local electrical infrastructure. So um, our residential projects are mainly uh, in Portugal, as I'm um, told. Um, we've had many issues on our installations on electrical um, infrastructure. So the local infrastructure is obviously in the building. Um, so obviously when you want to put a heat pump outside to provide heat um, using water, um, you want to try and put it in a location where you don't have any noise ingress into the house. You have to be searing it all the time. So when you want to relocate it, you put it in a location usually a little bit out of the way. Um, and then if you've got an infrastructure, electrical infrastructure that is already designed for other loads, um, you may find that the electrical infrastructure isn't up to it in terms of the size of the cabling. Um, so suddenly you have voltage drops when you have the compressor engaged on the heat pump. Um, one project we had in 2022, um, which was a, a small village in the north of Portugal, um, and this is pretty, pretty uh, normal. Um, the power supply from the utility is um, single phase, 30 ampere. Um, but when you're talking about that, some of these um, residential buildings, they was it houses, they have also other pumps um, working already on the um, the outside kind of land, I suppose you can call it. Um, for example, borehole pumps. Um, and so when you start putting on heat pumps, you start having um, a conflict on the power source. So literally, um, you do suddenly have the, the whole um, electric infrastructure shuts down when you have not enough power to, to run all these different pumps, the heat pump and the borehole pump. So there is no uh, upgrade from utility because uh, the EDP, which is the local um, utility supplier in Portugal, um, hasn't made the infrastructure to provide additional power um, infrastructure to these small um, communities. So when we're looking at um, this no-brainer in terms of the replacing propane gas with this a minimum COP of three, therefore 300% um, advantage in terms of cost. Um, there is some limitations on what can be done in, in, the, in the rural areas. So I think it's in, um, utility have to do a certain amount of investment. And I think the consumer has to realize that their local infrastructure um, of their house may have to be upgraded as well whilst looking at using a heat pump. We have tried to use um, two heat pumps on our, our installations. So therefore kind of um, having one that's running most of the time, taking most of the load during the day uh, in the year. And then obviously the second one comes on when the temperature drops down um, below a certain um, ambient temperature. Um, to try and actually reduce the size and obviously the size of the compressor when you have this um, ingress of, of uh, energy that's required. Um, so 
what we've done with a, what this one solution where we've had not enough power, we're actually looking at batteries now with um, literally um, connected direct to the battery, the heat pump. So we're literally having to develop a solution to try and uh, overcome um, this second heat, heat, uh, heat pump um, issue. Okay, so the second one, buildings themselves. Um, Northern Europe to Southern Europe definitely have a different uh, building model. Um, in Southern Europe, we have heavy, heavy mass buildings with high, um, high thermal energy um, storage, I would say, because we use the actual building in Southern Europe as a way of absorbing heat, um, particularly a kind of a battery. So whilst in Southern, it was Northern Europe, we have much lighter built structures, um, bricks um, and dry lining. And so heat pumps will have to relate to these different models of, of uh, construction because you will have a different application. Um, in Southern, in Portugal, for example, we were looking at using um, consistent heat throughout the whole day where possible to keep the fabric warm um, um, and then kind of putting on a, a heat pump um, at nighttime just to compensate for the drop in the ambient temperatures outside. So whilst in Northern Europe, you would kind of usually use your heating on a time clock where you put it on maybe an hour before you need it and then to turn it off. Whilst with the Southern Europe, if you go with that strategy, you'll end up with your whole fabric uh, cooling down and the interior temperature being cooler than the outside temperature in some cases. So again, there has to be some thought in the design process and the installation process and how to actually compensate all these different models. And I haven't even mentioned um, the east part of Europe where we have extremes, where we have extreme cold to extreme heat um, over the year. So uh, heat pumps, I think, have to, will have to be used uh, in, different, in different methodologies, uh, in different types of building models. So the third one, um, the heating emitters. So what I'm meaning by this is how you actually get the heat or the cooling um, into the building. So um, <laughs> in the UK, I've actually seen um, a lot of contractors using oversized radiators um, for heat pumps, um, which in my mind is a huge mistake because just the name radiator means that you are radiating heat across the room um, and when you're using lower temperatures, that radiation doesn't happen. Um, so what we're using um, for our clients is using a kind of a scroll fan in the bottom of kind of a similar radiator kind of um, system. Um, so it literally gives a certain amount of inertia to the heated air to get across the room to reduce the amount of cold, potential cold spots in a room. But obviously, um, underfloor heating is a, is a good one because it's quite a simple it's, um, system to install. Um, but when you're looking at um, environments in different parts of Europe where uh, cooling is required, obviously, underfloor heating doesn't really hit that target. So therefore, you're looking again, maybe using air to try and circulate that air across the room. Um, to provide heating and cooling. But again, we found some, some of the manufacturers don't actually, um, I'm talking about residential market here, obviously the commercial market is well catered for, but the residential market um, usually find that these uh, fan convector heaters only are providing the, the uh, potential for heating because they don't provide uh, drip trays, for example, for condensation when you put it into cooling. So again, the market here, I think, for emitters needs to be looked at in terms of the manufacturers, um, in terms of what, how they can actually provide um, suitable uh, methods of providing heat and cooling using heat pumps. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of area that can be um, expanded on there. 
Um, for the fourth thing is really um, the building services. Um, buildings are getting a little bit more complicated. Obviously, we're tr looking at trying to conserve energy um, and use more energy efficient methods of, of actually providing what we need in the building. Um, this also, we're looking at obviously heat recovery, for example, on ventilation systems, um, which obviously impacts on, on the design of a heat pump when you put it in. So when you, you, you put in the heat into a building, you're obviously having some amount of leakage which you require for ventilation. So, and then also you've got other things, um, I'm just gonna some notes here, but, um, just on, on my memory is that you've got other issues as well as water supplies. Um, I'm sure there's a whole lot of other things to think about when, when we're looking at building design, but um, just in terms of, of how this affects with heat pumps, um, it's not just a question of putting in a, in a heating system. I think you have to look at put a whole strategy of how you use your um, building services in the residential sector. The commercial sector, not mentioning that much because you have a whole ream of um, engineers who are designing these systems. Um, but when you look at residential, you literally look at a consumer that wants to try and make a change. And then you have a contractor. Um, it's very rarely you have um, engineering designers involved. So it's up to the consumer to really understand what needs to be done. Um, I think there's also uh, a future where we can integrate heat pumps into the building. So for example, as I mentioned previously, um, we have a way we need to kind of change over our air supply. So we need a certain amount of uh, air changes in our buildings to be healthy. So I think maybe we could try and put heat pumps, for example, on top of the top of the house, for example, to actually take out any heat that comes out when you're changing over the air at the buildings. So uh, just in the slide, I'm trying to show that there is a lot of thought that has to go into a heat pump installation um, to make it accessible. Um, so next slide, please. So the solutions. Um, well, it comes down to it. Um, to, to, we need to empower the consumer, um, mainly from education, but they have to be involved, obviously, when they're looking at putting a heat pump into their, their building. So I think the industry um, manufacturers, as well as uh, distributors and also even contractors, I think they, were, they need to demonstrate their applications um, of how to use heat pumps. Um, in terms of design process, um, what in I think you need to look at a wide area of different applications as well, because as as I demonstrated, we have a large area of Europe, and we need to kind of, kind of we need to try to bring in the whole of this uh, Europe into this heat pump market. So we need to kind of have a very wide um, example. Um, base to kind of enable the consumer to actually understand how they can use it. Um, subsidies aren't the answer. Um, I remember having a discussion with um, the European Community um, Commissioner previously about solar thermal uh, subsidies years ago, and it didn't really help the market that much. Um, it helps the manufacturing sector because it helps them ramp up their, um, their manufacturing capacities maybe. Um, but really, I think it needs to be done on a different approach or maybe with subsidies on a different approach. So I think a, a carrot and stick approach should be used, um, which involves obviously tax rebates. Um, so therefore a governmental approach so the EPC up to now hasn't really been used. I mean, it's just really just a bureaucratic piece of paper that needs to be provided when you sell or buy a house. Um, there has been lots of questions on the quality of the EPC um, being actually made by different obviously contractors throughout different countries. But I think there's a, an, an avenue here of actually providing the basis of a characteristic approach. So as you can see here, Frank Knight, um, Knight Frank, um, 
which is acquiring a large real estate company. Um, I agree with this approach where they're looking at a minimum EPC rate of C um, for certain buildings. Obviously, um, each national government can have their own targets. But um, obviously, it's been used a little bit already um, where there is some subsidies um, by some governments. Um, and but it hasn't really been used in terms of the consumer understanding what it means um, and obviously the advantages of it. But also when you tie into this, you can get obviously certain loans attached with, you know, in terms of the subsidies. So obviously there's a way of financing, um, not just the heat pump installation, but also um, the actual upgrade of the building, which is, I think, is more of a requirement when you're installing a heat pump. So therefore, the third item um, is where you have a transparent validation process. So obviously, with a lot of the greenwashing issues with manufacturing, um, advertising their, their products, is that um, one of the issues is confusion comes out because of all the different messages you kind of bring out. I think there has to be a very transparent way of getting across the information um, and therefore validating um, the application of heat pumps um, in terms of performance, in terms of lessons learned. So again, the consumer can learn from previous installations and not make them same mistakes again and again. So I think the whole sector of the heat pump manufacturing, as well as obviously um, this organization, um, I think has a lot of work in trying to get across um, a lot of information um, because we need to try and get the heat, heat pump numbers up dramatically. And so um, I don't think it's a subsidies in the pre first slide. Um, for example, the the urban example I gave, um, it may look quite um, approachable, but the problem is that the new heat heat networks, they aren't actually aimed at resident existing housing stock. They're based on new residential um, developments being built at the same time. So therefore this energy that they're providing is going to new build projects which have better energy efficient uh, um, characteristics, but obviously they can raise money um, for the infrastructure um, from the real estate um, by selling it through new, new organizations. So I think the main issue I want to try and put across on this presentation is that our housing stock is old in Europe, and this is the main sector that we need to be focusing on. The commercial sector has been focused on for a long time. I remember I've been putting on the heat pumps for decades. Um, the new sector of housing, um, I think, is um, obviously will heat, use heat pumps straight away. But the largest sector is the old housing stock that we have. So um, I think that's the conclusion I, I can give. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how well I'm doing your time on this presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I, I see that uh, uh, there are already some, um, some questions in the chat, and don't hesitate also to use the Q&A section. Um, so it's time now to present the last speaker, last but not least, um, Andrea Vogt. She is Vice President and Head of Global Public Affairs and Sustainability and member of the leadership team at Danfoss Climate Solutions. She joined Danfoss in 2021. Her experience in the heating and cooling industry spans over two decades. Prior or to Danfoss, for 12 years, she was Director General of the European Partnership for Energy and the, the Environment, a major Brussels-based industry association advocating for sustainable heating and cooling technologies. Previous assignments, including senior roles in sales, marketing and communication. Andrea is now member of the Refrigeration and Technical Options Committee under the United Nations Montreal Protocol. She is also a board member of the UN-hosted alliance, the Cool Coalition and the Global 
ABC, the Global Food Gold Chain Council, the European Heat Pump Association, and the <laughs> European Alliance for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. So today, Andrea will tell us more about trends and drivers for the decarbonization of our building stock. Welcome to this panel, Andrea, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elisabetta, for the introduction. And um, I think after those uh, very heavy technical presentations, I'm going to give it a little bit more of a policy angle to uh, to round off um, this uh, this session, which I think uh, is super interesting. I learned a lot already listening to my previous uh, speakers, and I think. What is really nice to see is that we all go into yeah into the same direction with the same key messages without even having coordinated on this beforehand. So I think that's a really good sign. So um, can I move the slides or do you have to do that, uh, Elisabetta? Okay, then you can just move on. Yeah, I will have to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Then you can just move to the next one. So just two words about Danfoss. Danfoss is a global company headquartered in Denmark. Um, with uh, three uh, strong uh, business segments. Uh, I'm belonging to the climate solution segments, which is all about heating and cooling. But then we also have a power solution segments, which is about industrial hydraulics mainly, and power electronics and drives, which is among others on frequency converters, etc. So we are very heavily engaged uh, in energy efficiency across the board and in electrification. Altogether, 40,000 plus uh, employees in the world and uh, also represented in many, many countries, 100 more or less, founded in 1933. So it's uh, a long standing family, still family owned uh, company. Thanks. We can go on. Um, oh, this screwed up the formatting from what I see. So um, I try to remember what I put into those boxes, but. What uh, what really strikes me is that we are working a lot in silos and uh, those silos are um, in many different areas. Um, we see silos on a technical perspective where you would have people working typically on heat pumps, people working typically on district energy, some of them thinking that there is a competition, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, it's rather the opposite. It's very complementary. So, those are silos which we need to bring together. Another typical silo configuration is between energy efficiency and renewables. You would have typically the energy efficiency community and the renewables communities. And if it works well, then they would talk to each other. If it doesn't work well, then they wouldn't even talk to each other because, again, there is this, this feeling of a perceived competition, which, again, is not at all the case. It's rather again, very complementary. Energy efficiency is a very strong enabler actually for the energy transition and for the transition out of uh, fossil fuel um, gases. So, so clearly we do have a very, uh, a very strong complementarity here between energy efficiency and renewables. No need to, to compete, but rather working together. Then a third a silo, um, which was I think in the bottom pop box, if I remember correctly, was in terms of uh, legislation and policy making and uh, directives, we would have typically climate related policies, um, which would look at, at greenhouse gases, for example. Then we would have energy related policies, which would look at uh, energy efficiency, energy performance of buildings, um, renewable energies directive, eco design and so on and so forth. So and again, a, a cluster of policies and then we also have sustainability policies, which are, for example, sustainability uh, reporting, um, which um, will come into force or has come into force on the on the corporate sustainability reporting directive. We have that on the supply chain with a corporate uh, sustainable due diligence directive. We have the taxonomy. All this package, which makes up um, the uh, the sustainable finance package, is actually a very a very strong um, cluster as well, which also very much uh, needs to come together and work together because it is very complementary again. And then the final 
um, silos, which we've seen also a lot in the past, uh, which I think is in the top box, is between heating and cooling, um, where you would have the heating people and the cooling people and not necessarily have them communicate with each other, which again is, uh, is um, not very productive because there are a lot of synergies between heating and cooling and uh, a lot of ways of really making the best of those synergies and use them in order to uh, save energy and save emissions. And that's particularly relevant, of course, when we talk about waste heat, which is the main focus of, of my presentation. OK, then to the next. So I won't spend a lot of time on the energy performance of buildings directive, but still, I think you cannot talk about decarbonization of buildings and not at least mention the EPPD. And even more so as uh, the parliament has uh, agreed on the EPPD now as well, um, has voted positively on the, on the last version, which is a very strong signal for all of us. We all very much uh, welcomed uh, in, the, in the building community the, the EPPD as it has uh, been uh, voted for now. And uh, we're now just still waiting for the final, final um, tick off um, by, by the member states. In a nutshell, um, and this is not at all um, aiming to be uh, comprehensive or exhaustive, but just to point to a few points in the, in the new EPPD, we of course have still the net zero driver for new buildings, but we also have, and that's new, and that's super important when it comes to renovation and decarbonizing our building stock. We have now minimum efficiency performance standards for existing buildings, which will hopefully also drive the transition out of uh, fossil fuel uh, boilers um, and, and help make our building stock more efficient and less uh, less energy consuming and also uh, reduce the emissions, of course. Then we do have national building renovation plans, which is a kind of follow up from the long term uh, renovation strategies that were existing beforehand. And again, those building plans, uh, those building renovation plans will hopefully further drive um, the, uh, the upgrading of our building stock. It's made visible with energy performance certificates. And then, uh, of course, we have um, new rules and stronger rules on uh, controls in buildings in the broadest sense, specifically if we look at, for example, hydronic balancing, but also other building controls. As I said, I won't go into detail here, but just to say that there are very strong drivers now coming out um, of the review revision of the EPBD, uh, which will hopefully uh, support the move um, out of fossil fuel uh, driven uh, appliances and boilers towards um, heat pumps and also towards um, decarbonized uh, district energy as a means um, to decarbonize the buildings also in conjunction with the heat pumps obviously. Okay. But um, Whilst the EPBD is one of those measures, everybody uh, working remotely in the in the Brussels uh, space and in the EU um, regulatory and policy space, as I said, what we'll think immediately about EPBD when it is about decarbonization of buildings. But there is actually another very strong trend which comes back to the silo thinking I mentioned beforehand which is coming from the sustainability community. And here uh, we have as a very strong trend, uh, carbon disclosure requirements. And that's not only in Europe, that's basically around the world. There are more and more countries which have uh, mandatory uh, requirements on carbon disclosure or climate disclosure uh, for companies. As you can see, I listed just uh, the, the countries that I found when I did a, a quick uh, desk research. Um, there are really, it's really a trend which uh, spans the entire the entire globe, and we see this coming stronger and stronger. And what does it do if you have to disclose um, your uh, your um, emissions, uh, the scope one and scope two and scope three emissions? Then of course it draws the attention to um, the performance uh, of your company in that field, and that then of course gives a very strong signal to the market, but also to investors, to banks, et cetera, on how well your company is performing in terms of sustainability. And that, of course, also concerns uh, our buildings, real estate uh, companies, et cetera, who um, will, uh, most of them fall under those uh, disclosure requirements and where it will become very vis visible how perform performant they are in terms of um, their emissions. 
The next slide, please. So will these uh, different policies, are they competing or are they uh, complementary? And as I said in the beginning, we need to stop thinking in silos and see the complementarity between uh, those different policy frameworks. And I try to, to just give a few examples on the left hand side and also to just uh, give the overall uh, interaction um, on the right hand side. The overall interaction clearly is if you have climate or carbon disclosure requirements, then as I said, it makes the emissions or the emission performance visible and that can then inform uh, policies and regulations to a certain extent, because then, of course, policymakers see uh, what the status is and where the emissions are coming from. On the other hand, uh, if we have policies and regulations in place, um, they will drive um, the emission uh, reductions, as just explained with the example on the EPBD, and that will impact uh, what companies disclose in terms of their carbon disclosure. So if we look how this works together, just uh, without going into greater detail of this slide, where also the formatting has been screwed up a little bit. <laughs> um, on the, if you look at the top right qu quadrant, um, then um, this is the situation which we have very much in Europe, I would say, where we have quite strong top-down rules um, in terms of climate and energy uh, policy and regulations. Um, if we can look at the FGAS regulation, for example, when it is about climate policy, we can look at eco design uh, when it comes down to product uh, energy efficiency requirements, the EPBD I just mentioned, etc. So those are uh, rules which are really um, are coming top down in order to uh, to drive um, energy efficiency and emission savings. But then we also have um, those uh, rules on sustainability reporting, on uh, sustainable finance like the CSRD, the taxonomy, et cetera, which come more from a bottom up approach, which basically, as I was saying, make emissions more visible and which kind of interact and complement um, those uh, strong top-down rules. So that's what we face in, in, in Europe, I would say. These two really working together, whereas there may be other uh, countries and regions in the world where you would have perhaps a stronger emphasis on, on those bottom-up rules in the, in the form of um, reporting and making emissions visible, et cetera, and less top-down requirements uh, as we have it in Europe. Perhaps the US could be an example where we see uh, a bit of a different approach um, with uh, less uh, command and control and more freedom to the market. But then there is no black and white, obviously. It's just to, to schematize it a little bit and just to, to show that those rules, in any case, um, work together and reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. So um, the sustainable finance, of course, brings it all together. And, and what we clearly uh, see here is that if it works, and it's still the whole sustainable finance package by the European Commission under the Green Deal is still uh, relatively new. So will it work as intended? We will find out, I guess. But if it works, then it can really be a virtuous uh, circle, which is all around ESG values. And why am I saying a virtuous circle? Because you would have financial institutions, asset managers, insurance managers, um, banks, etc., who um, would increasingly prioritize working with companies that have uh, strong ESG values in place. Why? Because for financial institutions, as for companies, um, if listed, shareholder value is, of course, very important. Risk mitigation is very important. Market demand and what comes from the customers is very important. Regulatory trends and also how you appear um, to your workforce uh, and to uh, retaining also uh, talent. So all of those factors drive um, the ESG values quite strongly and influence also financial institutions who want to be sustainable and who want to have a, a share of, of green assets in, in their portfolio. This would then influence companies because companies would, who, who tick those boxes and who have a strong uh, sustainability uh, strategy um, would uh, then um, 
further invest in such activities, which would then be sort of rewarded because they would then bet, get better access to finance and at the same time also better satisfy what comes in terms of push from the from the market. So there is a strong interaction there. And then the loop closes because as companies will become more sustainable, they will attract more investors and then they will get better terms uh, from those investors and financial institutions for their investments. So it, it really can close the loop um, because there is this strong money driver behind it, uh, which I think will be increasingly important um, as those rules are being implemented and also make their way into, into the general market behavior, which is already happening, by the way. It's not as if we don't see anything. It's, it's really already part of, um, of, uh, of um, the way how, how certain financial institutions at least um, uh, proceed and companies, of course, as well. If I'm just taking the uh, science-based targets initiative just as one example, I think it's in the meantime, it's like 3,000 companies or something who have voluntarily committed to science-based targets in order to really set themselves uh, strong commitments uh, to, to reduce uh, their emissions, just as an example. Okay, next one. So now to, I was saying in the beginning that I would focus this presentation on waste heat. And um, why waste heat? First of all, because um, I think uh, it's just a fabulous concept and it's not at all uh, exploited as it should be. But then also because it is a really good showcase uh, on breaking down silos. And on top of that, with a big potential to support deca decarbonization. If we look at the potential of waste heat altogether, and this comes from a, from a white paper that uh, we from at, at Danfoss have published uh, last year, which uh, comes to the conclusion that 2,860 terawatt hours per year of waste heat would be accessible in the EU. So that's more or less uh, the same as the primary energy demand in France, as an example, or um, as the EU's total energy demand for heat and, cot and hot water. So huge amounts available, not at all used as also um, my previous uh, speakers or uh, Christoph in the beginning was also showing uh, the potential of, of waste heat. So huge potential, but then also uh, we, we did a little research um, in um, across different pieces of legislation and of policies to see how is waste heat being tackled. And actually it's tackled quite a lot, but not in a, in a consistent manner. It's again in silos. So you would have waste heat, for example, in the Renewable Energies Directive, because waste heat uh, can be counted towards a renewable energy targets by, by member states. You would have a waste heat um, under the sustainable finance umbrella, where um, it's recognized um, as a climate mitigation measure in the taxonomy framework. You would have waste heat mentioned in the energy efficiency directive where it is pointed out specifically um, in terms of its efficiency potential in heating and cooling in the comprehensive assessments. You would have uh, waste heat as an important factor when you look at sustainability reporting, because if you use waste heat, then you reduce your scope one and scope two emissions. You would have waste heat in district energy, again, linking back to energy efficiency directive, uh, where it is also recognized um, as a renewable uh, energy and where it supports the decarbonization of district energy. And then you have the whole interplay of waste heat with heat pumps, uh, where heat pump can uh, recover the waste heat and upgrade it to the temperature required. So waste heat is tackled actually quite quite a lot, I could say a lot, but um, it's still not really being used as it should be and as, as the opportunity that it provides um, because all those different pieces of the puzzle are individual pieces of the puzzle and they are not brought together. So my strong um, call or ask would be to make this more comprehensive and break those silos and come up with a, with a really... Um, a uh, consistent approach to waste heat, which points to the huge potential it offers and uh, which also uh, motivates and um, 
raises awareness and um, incentivizes member states at national uh, or local or regional level to really use this huge waste heat potential to decarbonize. Yeah, next one. So um, just to, to show um, a, a little uh, schematic view on how the waste heat recovery fits into the sector integration and into decarbonization in general. And my previous speaker actually said, uh, very similar things in a different way and uh, from a more technical perspective, but nevertheless, uh, it's it's more or less uh, going in the same direction. We have to reduce uh, the energy that we consume and there are many different ways um, on how these energy savings can be achieved. Then we have the second big step in terms of reusing energy and there are different uh, sources of uh, waste heat um, that allow for this reuse of energy, and that can be, for example, um, from pressurized air, it can be from process cooling, so the waste heat from, from cooling installations. And for example, also if we have data centers, uh, and I can't remember it was if it was Christoph, Christoph or Neil who mentioned data centers, but that's also, of course, a very important uh, source of waste heat. So we have different, different sources for waste heat, which would allow us to reuse that energy and, and therefore save um, the generation of that energy uh, uh, in the first place. And then of course, the last step is sourcing green energy when necessary. Okay, next. So, and then I wanted to end with a bit of, um, with a bit of an excursion without going into super big detail, but just to show how all of those principles, everything that we heard more or less, can be applied in the framework of a city. And um, I picked uh, the example of Sonneborg, which is a, a small Danish city, um, not very far away from the German border, um, and which has uh, as a goal to become carbon neutral in its energy system by 2029. Uh, the next slide, please. And so um, they, how do they want to achieve this goal? And by the way, they are, they are really well on their way. They have uh, already reduced their emissions by, by 55% in the meantime. So um, still some way to go, but certainly achievable. They do these three major steps. And as you can see, the step number two is again, um, the reuse um, of the energy that we have already produced. So in other words, the recovery of excess and of uh, waste heat is a very important pillar in this approach of the, of the city um, of uh, Sonneborg. The next slide, please. So without, again, I can, I it would go far beyond uh, this webinar to go here into, into greater detail, but I just wanted to show this master plan which actually uh, enables um, this, the, this de decarbonization and, the, and the, the way towards the climate neutrality in 2029. What is really spectacular, I find, in, in, in Sonneborg and with the Project Zero is that you have all of those sectors work together and, as I said in the very beginning, break the silos. And that's why it works, because there is this overarching master plan where you would have a clear governance in place on how the city wants to go about reducing their emissions. And then you would have the specific clusters in that master plan where you bring the stakeholders that are involved in those, uh, in, in those different sectors around the table and find solutions together. And the result of, of that approach is, is this, as you can see on the left-hand side, is this comprehensive map where um, sector integration, uh, breaking the silos is really uh, playing a very important role. District heating and heat pumps being a very central pillar in, in this whole uh, setup, um, in the sense that, for example, uh, waste heat, as I was saying, is being recovered, for example, from, from uh, cooling installations uh, in a supermarket, for example, from, uh, from uh, Brick, brick factory, for example, um, from a waste incineration plant, for example. So all that waste heat is being uh, recovered and either reused on site or fed into the district energy grid. 
So no loss here, um, really a circular system, if I can say so. Heat pumps are being used um, either individually or to uh, upgrade uh, the, the temperature of uh, the heat available, uh, for example, in the industry and also in, in uh, commercial buildings or in a supermarket, as I was saying. We do have electrified uh, transport uh, vehicles. We do have power to X. A wastewater treatment plan where again the waste heat is being recovered and it's all controlled uh, with uh, digital um, tools. Um, digital um, in the sense um, that it helps, for example, the district heating utility to optimize their operation with our uh, with a program which is called Lean Heat, or also um, in buildings um, where the energy consumption in buildings is being optimized. So it's really about bringing all of this together under an overarching plan, which then enables um, the, the achievement of those emission reductions and of hopefully carbon neutrality by 2029. And the next slide. So just one example on, on one building uh, under that uh, master plan uh, from Sonneborg. So as I was saying, the driver is uh, the project zero, is what I just described. Uh, I forgot to say that it, and that's very important, is that it is a public-private partnership um, between the city of Sonneborg and all of those uh, private entity entities um, that uh, I mentioned, and of project zero, which is the kind of uh, steering uh, organism of, of the whole uh, carbon neutrality project. And so the Sonneborg Hospital in this framework wants to become uh, CO2 neutral. And uh, in that sense, because a hospital is typically uh, a facility where you need both heating and cooling. Um, so, so far, the hospital has not uh, used those synergies between heating and cooling. They now look into recovering um, the heat from the cooling system use on site what is necessary and then if something remains to feed this into into the district energy grid into the district heating grid and that of course brings a dual benefit perhaps even revenue path where of course you then need to produce uh, or um, or buy uh, less heat because you use they use the heat uh, coming from their cooling installations and where they can also cool the district return line in winter so, so that uh, the water is, uh, is uh, decreasing in temperature. And what is the beauty of this concept is um, this, this combination, or my colleague uh, calls it symbiosis, uh, which I think is a nice word uh, to describe it, where um, those both uh, facets, the heating and the cooling, um, are used uh, together. And if then uh, we calculate a total efficiency ratio, which looks at both the heating and the cooling capacity and then divides it by the power input from a total perspective, it then would increase the overall uh, coefficient of performance from 3.6 to 6.3. So that's really a massive increase by simply taking this holistic approach and, and bringing uh, the two together. Partners involved in that specific project under the Project Zero is, of course, the Sonneborg Hospital, then um, Danfoss but also, and uh, Rambol, Sonneborg Wärme, which is the district heating utility, and of course, the Project Zero. So that's just as one example within uh, this framework, which is work in process. There are many other examples, but I said it would uh, take too long to go into broader detail of all of those examples. Next slide. And I think that's also the last slide um, of my presentation. Um, this is coming from Project Zero, um, who uh, said very rightly, I think, if Sonneborg can do it, probably UOCD can do it too. Partnerships are really important. And to link back to what I said in the very beginning, breaking the silos is really um, the, the key solution here, not seeing the synergies that we have and making the best out of this, out of those uh, synergies. Seeing is believing. Come and visit us. Thank you so much.
Thank you, thank you, Andrea. Um, and sorry uh, for your slide. Um, no worries. That we have issues with Teams, with the new update of Teams, and uh, I can see the slide uh, correct, the correct one. No problem. But Don't once worry. I shared, uh, <laughs> so I, I also want to reassure participants: you will receive the right, uh, the, the correct <laughs> one. You can see everything there. <laughs> So uh, thank you. We're running a bit late on our agenda, but uh, um, all the presentations were really incredible. Um, now it's your moment to ask uh, questions. I will start. Uh, so I already saw that uh, uh, Christoph answered to, uh, to some questions on the chat. I have one question for Christoph, and I know that then he has to, to leave informally, but um, also, we are almost on end uh, of the of the event. So, Christoph, a question: What measures are necessary to implement these technologies and concepts? Sorry, yeah, I was muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for the, for for this question. Um, yeah, I think um, there's for sure a big uh, path in front of us uh, to reach this this this. Uh, yeah, this decarbonization, especially for the industry, and um, and I think th there's a still a big risk in these new technologies. Um, in 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 some applications, there's less risk. Uh, in other applications or other technologies, there are higher risk. And um, yeah, and I think here for sure, uh, funding is is one of the the, the uh, crucial thing, especially during the let's say low uh, energy prices what we have at the moment. Uh, again, um, um, we have to be or the renewables have to be uh, competitive, and uh, and here, fundings in in higher than than let's say normal funds. It's, it's a crucial point. Yeah? Um, I also think uh, that it is this first of a kind. Um, uh, applications or the uh, best practice applications um, are still crucial because uh, then we can create follow-ups uh, and 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 really roll out, uh, let's say, uh, these technologies and the application of these technologies. And, um, and and I think still as a, a good planning is important, especially for the industry, really to, to 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 have a good good idea how the concept should look like, and and really take time and and also have a kind of a roadmap in order to to reach this goal. Also, uh, maybe industry will not realize everything in once, but let's say step by step. And for this, you get you need a very good planning. I think from my point of view, are uh, uh, these the the main points to reach this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer and also for your presentation and for being here today. Um, I have a question for Andrea too. Um, where do you see the biggest opportunities for decarbonizing heating and cooling? <laughs> That's a very broad, <laughs> broad question. <laughs> but I, I, I really think um, as I, as I mentioned already in my in my presentation, uh, if we could have a stronger focus um, on uh, on the on the waste heat uh, in general, I think that would make a big contribution. It would make a big contribution to decarbonizing industry, which is one of the big challenges, really. Um, but it would also, I mean, industry in the broadest sense, it would also help. Um, the support the sustainability of data centers, for example, which is a fast, very fast growing uh, market. Um, and it would also help uh, decarbonizing district energy. And I think there we really see the, the, the connection also with the heat pumps very strongly because we can then make sure that we have the right temperature um, in either on site, uh, if the waste heat is used on site, or um, when it is used in a microgrid, or when it is used in a bigger district energy grid. I really think um, if 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 I had to give a, a message to the to the next um, commission and uh, and to the new MEPs once they come on board, um, it would really be let's let's use what we have and let's make sure that. We connect the dots um, to not uh, launch ourselves into expensive building up of infrastructure, etc., um, before having really used the potentials that we have already. Uh, I really think uh, that's a very 
important and very strong message to give. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I absolutely agree uh, with you. Um, Neil, um, one last question for you uh, from the chat that I can read. Uh, heat pump and cooling with sealing dead pipes uh, is a good alternative to air to air conditioning uh, units which require intensive maintenance. The sealing cooling will be a more healthy solution. For sure, this is more sustainable in public and office buildings. What is your opinion? No, no, it's, um, it's a used technology. It works well because obviously um, heat rises and uh, cooling drops. So it works well, whilst the heating floor is the opposite scenario. Um, yeah, no, in commercial, it's used all the time. Um, passive um, chill beams, for example. Um, in residential, a bit complicated in, in existing buildings. Uh, obviously, because you know, um, <laughs> just installing will be complicated, but obviously uh, keeping it going, maintained. Um, but in new buildings, new residential buildings like uh, open, open plan mm -hmm. buildings, for example, um, yeah, I mean, definitely. It's, like I said in my presentation, the main issue I think is the the legacy uh, housing stock that we've got, and how do we get around that? Thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. Uh, another question for Andrea uh, on the chat. Um, I also see that chemical industry is a large consumer for electricity and fossil industry. Do you see um, a fit for high temperature heat pumps and making use of waste energy of processes? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there is, uh, I think uh, if we look at temperatures up to 100 de degrees, um, heat pumps are I mean, it's mature. Uh, it's uh, there is no no problem in using heat pumps in in such temperature ranges. When it is higher temperatures, then um, it becomes uh, a bit more tricky, and there is certainly also more innovation needed. But from a general perspective, definitely, um, chemical industry is one of those industries uh, where uh, certainly there is a lot of waste heat from processes which uh, which can be reused in conjunction also with a heat pump. Thank you. And just one last curiosity. Um, as you mentioned in your presentation, Andrea, technologies are ready. So why are, um, are they not being deployed more broadly? Yeah, if only I knew. <laughs> no, I think um, I think part of the problem is really what I said in the in the beginning, the this this silo thinking. Um, if, if you consider that if you just take the cooling example, um, if you consider that you always have waste heat when you have cooling installations, always. And, and everybody knows that, I assume, but then there is no incentive, no trigger, no motivation uh, for those who have those cooling installations and have those that waste heat uh, at their fingertips to really use it. So they just it's just blown in the air. So um, I think there is a lot of awareness raising, which is, which is necessary, and then, and then perhaps also uh, incentives, not necessarily in the sense of subsidies. And I agree with the uh, comment uh, in the chat uh, that subsidies are, shouldn't be a holy grail, because once you remove them, you have the risk that the whole uh, market crashes down. So, so I really think um, uh, it, it can also be incentives, it can be re rewards, it I think there are many different carrots that can be given without having it having it uh, formulated as a subsidy as such. So, so I think in terms of business models, there is a lot of um, opportunities there as well, which need to be exploited still and which hasn't been done and which is probably part of the reason why it's not being applied. So awareness, um, business models, rewards, Maybe also flexibility, because you can add to flexibility if you have waste heat and combined with a thermal storage, for example. I think there are a lot of topics which are very much interconnected and comes back to the silo thinking again, where we don't connect the dots and where our policymakers also don't connect the dots, also because they work in silos. If we look at the European Commission, sometimes it's <laughs> between the DGs, uh, there's also sometimes a lack of. Um, connecting of the dots. 
indeed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, another question for Neil this time. Um, so uh, we have Valérie Sejourné. Uh, thanks for the presentation, and I really appreciated the concept of working in symbiosis together and avoid the silo thinking, as Andrea just mentioned. In this logic, um, how can these synergies between heat pump and solar thermal could be further fostered? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, we've been we developed a solution called Net Green Heat. Um, which uses solar thermal um, to provide um, a way of keeping all the internal fabric inside the building warm during the daytime. Um, and therefore, the idea is if you're heavy mass, well, I'm looking at Southern Europe here, so we've got heavy mass full of concrete, a lot of stone. Um, so if you've got your, your thermal fabric inside the, the house warm during the day, at night time, you just got to compensate for the drop of ambient temperature outside. So the heat pump can be used, obviously it rains, obviously the heat pump's got to be used. Um, so the idea with, with um, the high thermal um, characteristics in Southern Europe is that what you need consists is constant low grade heat all the day. Um, what 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 they used to use obviously is a lot of salamanders or these fires that have chucking logs consistently through the day and it's nice and warm and toasty. But um, if you try and use the northern strategy of like a time clock turning on your heating on and off, um, you you your house would never be warm um, in southern Europe. Um, so Going back to the question, so solar is really primarily used in climates where you've got a lot of radiated solar sunshine in Southern Europe, for example, um, and you just usually pump that heat into the house just to keep the fabric warm. And then the compensate is done by the heat pump. Understandable? <laughs> Thank you. So um, I can see that there's no questions for now. Um, but thank you very much uh, for the questions. Thank you to particip for participating to this webinar again. Um, also, uh, we spoke about funding, we spoke about awareness, uh, uh, we spoke about challenges uh, in these sectors. Um, I agree about uh, the needs to work in symbiosis, to connect in dots, as uh, Andrea told. Um, and to avoid the silo thinking. So I, I really wish that the new, um, the new commission and the new um, European institutions will work on that. Um, and uh, I want also to thank the, the speakers uh, because their presentation were really practical and, um, and sometimes technical, but also useful to raise awareness uh, on the renewable heating and cooling sector. So thank you very much. Don't uh, hesitate to follow uh, EHPA and follow, of course, the RHC platform website. You will receive uh, the webinar recording and the slide. And uh, once you re will receive the slide, don't forget to scan the QR code in all slides uh, to visit all the website I just mentioned. Thank you very much again and uh, see you at the next uh, event. Uh -huh.